Uh, it's 13 minutes past eight, and we're going to talk now about a rare eating disorder that can have devastating consequences. And a charity is warning today that people living with a condition called ARFID are being overlooked by the NHS in England. Yes, it stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. And calls to the charity's helpline about the issue are seven times higher than they were five years ago. The health service says it's vital that people with this condition receive support and that extra funding is available for eating disorder services. We can talk about this in a minute, but first, Abby Smitten has this report. The sheep has gone. The sheep has gone, yes. The sheep has gone. The sheep has gone. Sheep. 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 Bah. He was the most happiest, Hi. smiliest oh, little boy I've ever come across. His soul was just kind and he was soft and he was just so beautiful you were on the bus oh on the bus the sheep went on the bus you cheeky monkey there are memories of lucy's son alfie anthony everywhere you turn in their house he was diagnosed with autism when he was three although alfie was behind on a lot of things that i was aware of as a mother the one thing that always, always worried me was his eating. He struggled to eat anything with texture or lumps, relying on just a few safe foods. And I kept voicing, he's losing weight, he wasn't alpha. He just wasn't alpha, he was a poorly, poorly boy. And again, he, it got put down to his autism. Lucy asked for help, but didn't receive support. I was really fighting, like, I thought, like, I don't know what I thought, I just thought it was in my head or, like, nobody's, like, I'm screaming out and nobody was listening. In 2021, he passed away at the age of seven. His cause of death was malnutrition. It was only after he died that Alfie was diagnosed with ARFID, an eating disorder that can be caused by sensitivity to food textures or smells. An inquest found healthcare professionals didn't pay enough attention to his diet. Together we were invincible. No one else could come close. I shook myself away from those who I love the most. Poetry has helped Jess cope since she developed Arford. You have become my biggest secret, but I couldn't keep it up for long. She has a phobia of vomiting. One day she was sick after a meal. Pretty much overnight, I stopped eating. My relationship with food automatically changed overnight. And while everyone else needed food in order to survive, all of a sudden, I was learning how to survive without it. She went for three years without support until she met Gemma from the eating disorder charity, Seed. Hello. Hi, Gemma. God, it's been too long. I feel like I'm starting to get back on track again. Obviously, there's going to be ups and downs, but I feel like I'm, I'm feeling positive again and I've got a bit of a spark back. It's about treating the person and not the eating disorder and that it's so important to like, remember that Jess is Jess. Recovery is not a one-way street. Like It's a recovery after recovery after recovery, so I'm just really proud of you. I just can't thank you all enough for, for saving my life. So we need to get a meeting in then, I guess, ideally this week. Nicole and Stacey both have loved ones with Arford. They were shocked at the lack of awareness and support available. In response, they set up the first dedicated Arford charity in the UK. If you can imagine going online and there being basically nothing about Arford, it was, it was an information black hole, essentially. That was part of the frustration um, that I was experiencing, is that I was dealing with uh, doctors, paediatricians, um, dietitians who had never actually heard of ARFID before. Ready? Steady? Since Alfie's inquest, Stockport NHS Trust has said they're deeply sorry they missed opportunities and have introduced new guidelines. Hello. Come here. Lucy is now calling for better awareness of ARFID, especially around its links to autism. I really, really want a pathway for understanding and knowledge for children on the spectrum. I don't want it to happen to anybody else. So 
although this hopefully will help other families, I will continue being his mum. I'll keep being his voice. Just sadly I wasn't heard then, but I'll make sure I'm heard now. Abby Smitten with that report for us. Let's improve all our awareness about this, shall we? Joined now on the sofa by Lisa Valentine, who was diagnosed with ARFID in 2019. Morning, Lisa. Morning. Alongside her, Gemma Oden, who you'll know from Emma Dale, <laughs> uh, who's also chief executive of the Eating Disorders charity C. We saw you in that piece. And Kerry Fleming is head of safeguarding at the charity Beat. Morning, Kerry. Um, Lisa, can, can we start with you, I think, yeah. if that's OK, about your experience of ARFID and, and, and how it affected your life? Usually. So my symptoms started in 2017. Similar story, I had a choking incident. The day after, I couldn't swallow my food, which sounds bizarre. <laughs> I'd gone to work, tried to eat my sandwiches, which basically couldn't swallow the next day. And you'd never had anything like that before? Not really, no. I'd had a few sensitivities with food, but nothing physical, if that makes sense, um, like preferences over the physical. My throat just wouldn't cooperate. I kept gagging and retching whenever I tried to swallow food. Um, eventually went to the doctor, kind of got dismissed a bit, saying it was temporary trauma, you'll be fine on protein shakes. Deal with it for a little while. I was embarrassed, I was humiliated, I was in my mid-30s, so it was, you know, it was a little bit of an unusual situation. It was only when I'd lost a dramatic amount of weight, I lost a third of my body weight in a few months. Gosh. That's when the medical intervention started. I went through all kinds of things, through ENT clinics, so I had a lot of checks in my stomach, in my nose. Um, I went through speech therapy because nobody really knew what was happening because there wasn't an obvious answer for it. Um, and it was a speech therapist who said, look, your throat is working OK. I think this is a psychological problem. And that was after two years, two years. So in 2019, I finally got my diagnosis of ARFID. Um, had no idea what it was. Again, did a lot of research, relied on charities. Um, even my GP didn't quite know what to do. I was then sent for CBT. Um, to help and then the pandemic started so that was cancelled and I'm now kind of in recovery is the very short version of it and um, big impact <laughs> and, and Gemma I know you have huge experience of helping people recover and you know, live with um, different types of disordered eating how does ARFID differ from what you've come across before I think, I think for me that the, the striking thing is that in this day and age at the moment eating disorders that the, the, the the society we live in seem to point eating disorders and the blame on social media, on media, on, on images, on body image. But actually, ARFID goes to show that that is not the sole case. The difference with ARFID and other eating disorders is one of the driving factors is not about weight and body image and body shape. So somebody who is struggling with ARFID isn't, isn't fixated on their weight being low or how they look. It's, it's very much deep-seated in sociological issues, psychological issues. But for all of these eating disorders, what remains the same is that early intervention is so key. And for Lisa to be given like two years trying to navigate away. It's the same with me when I was 10. You know, I got turned away from the doctor telling me I wasn't poorly enough mm -hmm. to have a problem. Cut to a year later, I'm given 24 hours to live and we're still battling this. You know, some, <laughs> don't want to give my age away, but some 30 years on, you know, and, and it's kind of comes to a point where we need to understand more about ARFID, but we need to understand more about eating disorders as a collective and implement early intervention. But the funding's just not there to do it, nor is the research, and we must do better. Kerry, from your experience, I mean, how common is ARFID? Do we, do we have any idea? No, so there's no existing research, really. It's quite limited. The research we do have says 1% to 18% of people with eating disorders are living with ARFID. But given there's not enough money or funding going into research, we don't have any more specifics than that at the moment. And that's part of the problem, I guess. Very much so. We know that it is a very serious mental health condition and we hope that people who are maybe listening today are realising that they're not alone in it and maybe relating to some of the things that Lisa has spoken about and how that presents that they can and should be seeking support. And is it the case that diagnosis, because the symptoms perhaps aren't what you might imagine, the classic eating or disordered eating mm -hmm. symptoms that we've seen before and spoken about on this programme, because the symptoms and the things that lead up to it are different, is there confusion now over diagnosis? I think so, and I think it just comes down to that lack of awareness. As we hear from so many people today and over the past few months, People don't have not heard of it, do not know what it is. So I think the basis is of this week going into Eating Disorder Awareness Week at BEAT, we just want 
awareness to be made aware. We want people to be confident speaking out for what they need and what their loved ones need. Which is why it's so important that, that you know, you're all here today and that, Lisa, people who, who've been through it are sharing your stories. I mean, what, what do you want people at home to know this morning? Yeah, just so you're not on your own. That was one of the biggest things for me was the social isolation. So we got to weddings for meals and there was a lot of questions around why aren't you eating? And so it sounds silly, but it had a massive impact on my personal life, my social life, professional. Um, but yeah, you're not on your own. Keep pushing, do your research and advocate for yourself with your, with your GPs. And is that part of the problem? What other people say to you about mm. it? What would they massive. say to you? People would dismiss it and yes. think it was just silly because you'd be pushing food around a plate and, again, what or do you mean you can't eating. swallow food? Yeah, yeah. I'd dismiss it as picky eating, but it's so much more than that. Um, it's very real. I always say that, like, food is not the cause, it's the symptom mm. yeah. when it comes to an eating disorder. And I think, I don't know if you agree, but I, it's, I said on the VT, it's about treating the person, not the eating disorder. And we can't be all put under the same bracket. Not one size, no pun intended, fits all. But that is so true. It's not about weight, body shape. It's about a psychological issue that needs urgent attention before it becomes drastic. And when you say treat the person, what does that mean? What does that person need? a lot of the time. With eating disorders, one thing an eating disorder loves is confrontation and, and aggression, and it wants to hit back and destroy everything around it. What I mean by that is it's so important to remember that Lisa is still there, that Jess is still there, that I am still here as a human being, not just somebody who feels like when they walk into a, a room of GPs and, and psychiatrists is just a number. It's about remembering who that person is and I think one of the key things about how to talk to somebody who you think might have an eating disorder or does have one is that it's about kindness compassion it sounds so simple but kindness compassion and empathy and making sure that that person is heard and loved and seen. Kerry there are bound to be people watching this morning thinking gosh maybe this is me or yeah. maybe this is a relative or a friend of mine well, yeah. where should people go to, to find help advice? I think we would always recommend they do go to their GP. Awareness is happening. Do you know, more and more professionals are becoming aware of it. We're providing training for this across the country now as well. What I would also say is to contact our helpline. We have online support groups running for people to reach out to other people who are struggling with it as well and to other carers. So do reach out to Beats Helpline and our advisors will be on hand to, pro to tell you what's available in your area. And Gemma... You indeed have your own charity to support people, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, see eating disorder support services. We're here too. And one thing, you know, that we have got at the moment is REDCAN, which is a regional eating disorder charity alliance network, which is something very new that we forged last year with regional eating disorder charities around the UK. So please do check out REDCAN as well because they're a vital source of um, information and, and support as our, our beat and seed. And, all of us who are just trying to do a yeah. little bit of good but need more support yeah. in the third voluntary sector. Yeah, and Lisa, three, four years after diagnosis, yeah. a smile, you're yes. doing all right. Yeah, I'm pretty much in recovery. <laughs> we were saying probably 95%. I still have some social situations. So it takes me a long time to eat. So if you're in a restaurant, the waiters will and waitresses will be nudging you a little bit. But yeah, 95% in recovery. I think it's chronic. I don't think I'll ever be fully recovered. But yeah, it's, it's a good start. I've had, had the right support. Well, well done. And well done. Thank you for helping others as well today. Mm, thank, you. thank you all. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.